in that chapter of chapter 14 uh, is there uh, unrighteousness with God and is there any injustice with God it describes a condition of not being right it describes unrighteousness of heart of life resulting in wrongdoing could this be described of God and Paul says may it never be God forbid may it never be so the idea is always with the thought perish the thought by no means certainly not Do we conclude that God is in is, is in considerate, unfair? Never. So Paul states from the very beginning that God can never be accused of being unfair. That's the bottom line. Verse 15 then goes on to say. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It's an interesting thought as we look at that text this morning. This morning. The connection and the argument is obvious. It is not unjust for God to exercise his sovereignty in the distribution of his mercy. He expressly claims the right. God has the right to give mercy to whom he wants to have mercy and, and, and not on others. And Paul quotes Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 33 and verse 19. And Paul has already shown us that all mankind is under sin. Romans chapter 3 and verse 9 and justly deserves God's righteous wrath, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. But God, who is rich in mercy, looks down and he has mercy on some and compassion on some, and he has mercy and compassion on whomsoever he chooses. This should cause us to fall on our face and cry out, Have mercy on me when I justly deserve hell. What an awesome truth that is. We come to a point of recognizing, I deserve hell. And if I end up in hell, I, I must say that I deserve. If I go to heaven, I say, I don't deserve to be here, but it's God's mercy that got me here. His mercy. Interesting word. It means to feel sympathy with the misery of others. Especially such, such symptoms which manifest itself in action less frequently in word. It describes the general sense of one who has compassion or person on someone in need. He, he, God has mercy on those who have need to have mercy. Someone has said it in the classic Greek, it is the emotion aroused by contact with an affliction which comes undeservedly on someone else. Piety, pity, compassion, the, feeling, the feelings are the reverse of envy and another misfortune. It signifies to feel sympathy with the misery of others. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. That word compassion is used only here in Scripture. And it means to exercise pity or to have compassion on, and on one is moved or motivated by sympathy. That word mercy, once again, expresses the heart of motivation and compassion, the manifestation of that feeling. Mercy expresses the heart motivation and compassion manifest is the manifestation of that feeling. In other words, his sparing in Exodus chapter 33 of Exodus 
and continuing to guide and protect them was purely reflective of His mercy and His grace. He had the absolute right to condemn us or to save us as He divinely saw fit in God's sovereignty and His grace not only are complement, but they are inseparable. God has a right to make decisions as He sees. It is equally true, Spurgeon said, that he, that he wills to have mercy and has already had mercy on every soul that repents of sin and puts it trust in Jesus Christ. So, Spurgeon went on to say, this means that God's mercy and compassion cannot be subject to any cause outside His free grace. God had mercy on the Israelites, not destroying them for their adultery, not because they deserved it, but simply because He chose to be merciful. We cannot say God showing mercy on us, we deserved it. We're not saved because we deserved it. We're saved because God is showing mercy on people who don't deserve it. How shall those who are the subject of divine election sufficiently adore the gospel of grace? So then how did God save us? What caused God to save you and I? We have no room for boasting. For sovereignty most effectively excludes it. The Lord's will alone is glorified, and the very notion of the heart merit is a cast of everlasting contempt. In other words, we cannot say that we had any boasting, that we can boast on anything on our part to say that we're saved. Romans chapter 60, verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So then, it does not depend on man who wills, or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. This is a picture of human thinking and striving is seen in John's description of those who become children of God by faith and who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Did you come to God because you wanted to come to God? I think that is very what we do a lot of times, we want, we, we, we want to make people think that they need to come to God. We want to make people think that they need to run to God. We need to think, we make, we, we want to make people believe that, that they can go to God and request of God that they be saved. Salvation is by invitation only. You have to be invited to be saved. You have to be given an invitation to be saved. And by the way, I will throw this in. And here's what a lot of people will say. Does, doesn't God give an invitation to all people to be saved? If I say to you, uh, we're having some people over today to eat, I may not mean you. I gave an invitation publicly, and you heard it, but it doesn't mean that I've invited you. Sorry. We have people who, who, who invite others to come when they have, you know, people come to our house, and they'll invite someone to come with them that we haven't invited. <laughs> so then when God, so when I'm giving an invitation for people to be saved, the invitation goes to those whom God has called to be saved. And my prayer has always been, Lord, 
Would you call those whom you called to be saved today? Would you give a call to them to be saved? If there's lost people in this church, my prayer is, Lord, would you call them today to be saved? That's my prayer. That's what Charles Spurgeon did. Charles Spurgeon said, God, there are a lot of lost people in our church today. And would you, by your mercy and your grace, call some of them to be saved? I like that, don't you? Because when God calls, they come. When God calls and opens your heart to see your sinfulness, people come to the nut, come to the, they, they know they need to be saved. I give the invitation for everybody to be saved. I want to see everyone saved. So the invitation is to everybody, but only God calls. And those whom he calls hear and they get saved. But on oh God who has mercy, it is not us coming to God and saying, well, God, I'm the one that wanted to be saved. I asked you to save me. There's a big difference than, you, than God said, no, I called you to be saved. Instead, you said, no, Lord, you need me. I want you to save me. But it's on God who has mercy. God who has mercy. It's the present tense. It signifies he never lacked for mercy. He, he, it, it is a continuing attribute of his character. God is still calling people to be saved today. Amen. It is not a man's choice or pursuit, but God who initiates mercy... For the sinner, salvation is never initiated by human choice or merit by zealous human effort. It always begins in God's sovereign, gracious, eternal will. Those who receive God's mercy receive it solely by His grace. 